Dear Heavenly Father, I do pray that uh, you'll settle my soul, settle my heart, and that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart will truly be acceptable in your sight. I pray that we will learn new and wondrous things about you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start with a quote from Sun Tzu from his classic, The Art of War, which was written about two and a bit thousand years ago. And it says this, If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. The reason I, I've quoted that is that so often Christians live in a rose-covered, rose-coloured glasses world. And I think sometimes we are frightened to think about the other side. We acknowledge the existence of the enemy and we put up with the views of science, but at exactly the same time, we don't have a fundamental look at what is going on in the world, what is being thought in the world, uh, trends that are happening in the world, because for some reason or other, we're frightened of them, and we don't need to be. As a matter of fact, as Christians, we should be bold enough to be able to read things that we don't agree with and be able to see those parts that they get right and disregard those parts that they get wrong. And at exactly the same time, it's also handy to have a look at, and tonight is more of, I'd probably say more of statistics and more of a a, a classic lecture than what I would normally do. Because tonight we're going to be looking at what what are non-Christian views of God. And it's important that we know some of these things because that helps us know how to relate to people. Australia is a secular country. We like to think it's a Christian country, but it is way more secular than the United States. And we need to have a basic understanding of how Australians think, but also an understanding of those religions that are becoming more and more prominent in Australia. I got some statistics from the census from 1947 through to 2001. And it has to do, I don't know if you can see that very well, but it has to do with Christianity and the different Christian um, denominations. So back in 1947, 87.3% of the population claimed to be Christian. Now, uniting doesn't start till 1981, but way back then we had 4.9% of the population, and now, sorry, in 2011, we had 5% of the population. That's an increase. But if you look at Anglicans, have gone from 39% down to 17%. Catholic have gone from 20% up to 25.3% in 2011. You notice, if you look at the Methodist line, it started at 11.5%. Presbyterian was 9.8%. But if you look at 2011, Presbyterian is 2.8% of the population. And the Uniting Church is 5% of the population. You add the, the first two together, they do not match the last two. All across the board, except for the Baptists, the Lutherans... The Pentecostals and other denominations, they're the only ones that have had an increase. So we've dropped from 87.3% in 1947 down in 2011 to 61.7%. And the decline gets even better. I don't necessarily know that I have a slide for this next one. But in 2021, which was last year, 
in difference or different to 2011 where it was 61.7, now it's only 43.9% of the population that claim to be Christians. 38.9% of the population claim to have no religion. That doesn't mean that they don't say that there is a God, but they claim to have no religion. Islam is 3.2%, Hinduism is 2.7%, and Buddhism is 2.4%. And if you look at those religious affiliations, you can see the blue line at the top is Christians. The orange line is no religion, and the other blue line, or the darker blue line at the bottom, are other religions in Australia. But concentrating on those people that say they have no religion, you've got to be very careful. Because when people are surveyed and they say that they have no religion, it's not as simple as people saying, I don't believe in everything. In anything, sorry. There was a survey done that in Western Europe, and Western Europe is a lot more godly, a lot more God-fearing in a sense than... Sorry, a lot less godly than Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is a concla or the enclave of Orthodox and Catholics from way back. But in Western Europe, a lot of people say they believe in God, but they don't believe in the God of the Bible. And there was this survey that was done of 15 countries that were historically very, very Christian. And nearly all of them still have a Christian majority. However, few and fewer and fewer respondents said that they believe in the God as believe in God, sorry, as the described in the Bible. And that's actually common in Australia as well. They believe in God, but they don't believe in the God as described in the Bible. It says from this survey, a lot of them would say something like. We believe in some other higher power or we believe in some other spiritual force. But as well, a lot of people don't believe in any higher power or any spiritual force whatsoever. What makes it even sadder though is that belief in the biblical God amongst Christians, this is what the survey said, the belief in the God of the Bible amongst Christians is declining. Even though more people who are Christians believe in God than people who are not Christians. So even within the church, people are no longer believing in the God of the Bible. And it says, while most non-practicing Christians say they do believe in God. Now, non-practicing Christian is someone who goes to church either less than once every six weeks or someone who goes at Christmas and Easter. That's a non-believing Christian. And most of them say they do not believe in the God of the Bible. And so a lot of people don't believe in a higher power at all these days. But then there are the other religions. And can you, is there another, are there, there another one? That one there. So this is um, worldwide. If you look down the second row, Judaism has about 13 million followers around the world. Christianity has about 2 billion followers. Muslims have about one or just over one billion followers. Hindus have just less than a billion followers. Buddhists are around 330 million. And six Sikhs are around 25 million followers. So they are the rough statistics for the world. Can you go back to the one that says census 1947-2011 non-Christian? If you look back in 1947, this is Australia, 0.1% of the population was Buddhist. Now it's 2.5. Hinduism, none, 1.3 in Australia. Islam, 0.4. Now it's 2.2. It's actually climbed. 
no religion. See that? Back in 1947, it was 03 of a percentage point. Now it's 20, well, in 2011, it was 22.3, and I said it's up at 34 or 38 now. And we do need to have a basic understanding of the, of the statistics. I'll tell you why. What is the second congregation that comes and visits here every Sunday? Indian. Indian. Australia is becoming a big mission field. And it's worthwhile studying some of the other religions to work out how you can talk to them. Because they are worshipping the enemy. And the mission field is coming to us. We don't need necessary, so we don't only need to do it from a mission perspective, but we also under, need to understand it from the way that it's going to influence Australia in the long run. So, for example, there are counties in England where the road signs are in English and Arabic. And I found it very interesting when I was in Brisbane Airport the other day. The signs are in English and Chinese. We have an Indian congregation that meets here. They're Christians, yes. The um, petrol station up the road has been bought by the Indians. Australia is becoming not a homogenous multicultural society, but it's becoming a divergent multicultural society. And if you think about it, the only thing that is different in this particular church is that Christianity is holding all of the three congregations together. The expatriate Australians, the, Indian, the Indian congregation, and the Islander congregation. What is the common denominator there? It's Christ. That is the only thing that can hold Australia together. So it is interesting to look at these statistics. It is a good idea to understand what's going on. So as we look at these different religions and how they're going to influence Australia, how they're going to be a mission field coming to us and how they're going to develop our country, it is perhaps just as important to look at Australia and realise that with the 30... Let me get that particular figure right again. 30... 34.8? The other 38.9 percentage of the population that have no religion and how much that isn't going to influence us. So it's probably a good idea that we have a look at those non-Christian philosophies and what they say about God. But before we do that, a French philosopher, Christian philosopher back in the 1600s wrote, Blaise Pascal, please. He wrote, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but there, there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and the trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help since this infinite abyss Abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. That was in the 1600s. We all know C.S. Lewis from the last century. He wrote, Christians are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. So for example, a baby is born. You touch the side of its mouth, it tries to go for a teat. A baby feels hungry. Well... There is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel and women feel sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. This is where we get the idea of the God-shaped hole in people. The Apostle Paul wrote in Acts 17, as he's talking to the people in the Areopagus. Areo so Paul, standing in the middle of the market, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. 
For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. And we as Christians can say to the community that is saying, we believe in a spiritual power or a spiritual being. You worship the unknown God, but I'm going to proclaim this to you. I'm going to claim who he is. Now, I think that I want to start. That was the introduction. I want to start and I want to say two things and two things only. One is from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Never let that foundational statement be less than it truly is because it's the start of where we think. It's the start of where we believe. It's the start of all of our theology. And the second one comes from one of my favourite little two-verse passages, which is Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. It says this, For what can be known about God is plain to them, plain to us, because God has shown it to us. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. These two concepts we have to hold on to as believers. And if you hold on to them, no matter what you think, no matter what you read, you will never go astray. With my second son, I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want to give him $5. But with my second son, I keep saying to him all the time, if you start there, you can read anything and it will not affect you. You will understand where they're coming from and you will see the way that God can fix that situation or even the things that they are talking about God, even incorrectly. One of the things that we have to understand is that there is, this is not a questionable statement, there is a yearning that everyone has that they want to be filled and there is only one person that can fill it and that is Yahweh. I use God's name, Yahweh. He is the only one that is able to fulfill it or fill it. See, if we don't, as we start thinking about this, if we don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we will never fill the void. And if you think about it, we in a sense venerate Plato, we venerate Socrates, we venerate into our more modern era Rousseau and Christian Schaefer and all these modern thinkers and philosophers. But we've been, we've been listening to them, wanting to hear what they've wanted to say from time immemorial because we have need to have that soul emptiness explained. Because as, if you take into account the fall, we don't want to fill that void with the Creator God. We want to fill it the way that we ourselves want to fill it. I would suggest that in our day and age, in actual fact, the God that we worship the most is actually money. But in general, people formulate different philosophies to put a band-aid on the emptiness and then we fill it with drugs, we fill it with alcohol, we fill it with sex, we fill it with violence, we fill it, fill it with so many different ways so that we don't have to think about or question that emptiness or think about the universe in general. But I think it's really also very important to, to look at them briefly tonight so that you can identify how the enemy is also bringing these philosophies back into the church. Because it's hard to hold this, well it's not hard, but people find sometimes it difficult to hold this up and say this is the foundation that we're going to stand on all the time. And it's much, much easier from a cultural perspective, it's much, much easier from a church perspective to allow these these philosophies to come in and wash away the foundation that is the scriptures. Remember what Paul says in Galatians 1.8. He says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be anathema. Let it be kicked out. Let him be accursed. So the reason I'm bringing these up tonight is so that you know, so that you can see it, so that when it comes into the church... 
you can address it, dismiss it, rebuke, reprove, teach, those sorts of things. So be on your guard. Now, when we come to basic philosophies that exp explain the universe, there are, there are two sorts of philosophies. There are ones that are theistic, that have a God or a God figure or a God force in them, and non-theistic, accidental, or whatever. So theist, theistic philosophies hold that there is a God or gods, and non-theistic hold that there is no God at all. And I'm going to run through them very, very quickly. There is what's called a pantheistic view. Two words, pan and theist, meaning all and God. It's the belief that God is all and all is God. Pantheism is a theory which regards everything, all finite things, as merely aspects or parts of one external self-existent being. It suggests that there is no God apart from nature and that everything in nature is a part or a manifestation of God. Gear we worship, Gaia we worship. Trees, birds, flowers, all parts of God. Nature is God. Pantheism. It also plays a part in some of the more radical types of Pentecostalism. There are also different types of pantheism. And I'm not, believe me, I cut out a lot of this lecture because it was boring even me. There's materialistic pantheism. There's hyzoism and panpsychism. There's neutralism. That's a summary where they fail in the moment. Neutralism. Idealism. Idealism is interesting because it's the theory that everything exists only in your mind. It exalts and deifies the person and the mind of men as if there's either some universal God of the mind or the mind is God or that we are all part of that. And there's different types of idealism as well. There's impersonalistic idealism. This says that the ultimate reality is one single mind or one unified system. And it denies that we're different, that we're individuals and that we have free will. There's personal idealism which holds that the, the absolute is a person which includes us. There's philosophical mysticism. Philosophical mysticism is any philosophy that seeks to discover the reality of nature through the process of thought or spiritual intuition. This is a bit like the New Age movement. The idealist distinguishes between himself and the great self. The mystic sees himself as being identified with this great self out there. It makes man into God. It claims that the only God to be known is the God that's within us. Doesn't that sound a lot like our modern age? And so the conclusion with philosophical mysticism is that we're gods ourselves. If you think about it, we're totally deluded at that point. We're absolutely falling way short of an accurate knowledge of God. But the thing about all of those things, yes, we can dismiss them. But be assured that what it does is it says about the, the heart and the mind of man that we intuitively believe in stuff. It's part of who we are to believe in something. If we have to make up these great stories. But they also show how people reject God's revelation of himself. Remember Romans chapter 1? We reject it. See, in trying to find God in creation, they make creation God. And we miss the creator behind it. So in summary, up there, pantheism makes nature God and misses the God of nature. Materialism makes matter eternal and misses the God that made the matter. Hylozoism makes a principle of life God and misses the God who is the source of all life. Can you go back, please, Abel? 
Neutralism makes some neutral substance God and misses God, the creator of all the substance. Idealism makes the mind God and misses the God who is a real person having a perfect mind. And philosophical mysticism makes man himself God and misses the God who made all men. But it shows the whole that is in the heart of all people. Then we have what's called the polytheistic view, and that means many gods. Most ancient religions were polytheistic, had many gods. And I don't, that actually could be a fun whole lecture in itself um, when they talk about the evolution of religion, because they get it all wrong. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that all of the religious scholars, secular religious scholars, are absolutely wrong in this. They all say that, ev that religion developed, that it evolved. Whereas if you look at the scriptures and you look at Genesis chapter 1 through 6, 1 through 11, you realise that everyone believed in one God. And it wasn't till the fall and the development of society and civilization that we started to get local gods and then we started to become um, then we started to go to um, polytheism where we had a god of this or a god of this country or a god of this particular attribute etc etc if you look at hinduism with their 100 and no with their 1 million 300,000 gods or something that they've got at the moment that is probably a best representation of the de-evolution of religion. That's what happens when you take it from one God to a pantheon of gods to a God of absolutely everything. The, you know, by the time after the flood and after the revival of civilization, you look at the Egyptians, and this is just in the Middle East, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, they were all polytheistic. If you look at South America, the Incas, the Mayans, they were all polytheistic. You look at Asia, they were all polytheistic. All right? But if you look back at their earlier culture, earlier legends, even the Australian Aboriginals, if you go back far enough in their stories, you'll find that in nearly all cases, there is a one that starts it all. And they worshipped all sorts of gods. And that's why in the scriptures it says don't make an image of anything. They made gods of every single created thing that they could think about. They worshipped the sun, they worshipped the moon, they worshipped the planets. If you get to the Romans and the Greeks, they, they worshipped semi-gods, half-gods, demigods, gods who were half-men, um, the other thing I think that's interesting about the Greeks and the Romans is that they actually made gods out of virtues and vices, like Bacchus, the god of drinking and parties, you know, Eros, the god of sex, sex etc., etc. If you look at the, um, around Israel, the Canaanites and the Philistines were polytheistic, Asherah, and uh, what's his name? Dagon and those others, Moloch. Um, Dagon of the Philistines was supposed to be half man, half fish. Aquaman. <laughs> um, and if you look at scriptures, and it's not on the board, but if you have a look at Exodus chapter 20 and chapter 34, Leviticus, God explicitly says, you don't make gods, you don't make images of gods. He also says in Exodus 23 and Deuteronomy that all idols were to be destroyed. They were not to be worshipped. They were not to be kept as souvenirs. I think that's something that's, that, that's interesting. And it's, it's, I'll give you a, a thought that I had the other day and I think I mentioned it beforehand. Just say you're a lady and you have to get your, your, your feet a pedicure. Sorry, Mum, I'm not looking at your feet on purpose. But just say you had to get a pedicure and you go down to Fairfield Waters and you walk into the pedicure shop. Now, I think there's nothing wrong with getting a pedicure. Not my cup of tea, but there's nothing wrong with it. But if you look and there's a shrine to Buddha on the floor inside the door, you actually have a decision to make. 
because we don't realise it in our society, but they have claimed that shop for their God. You are now on, in a sense, their God's territory. Hmm? But I'm saying you have to make choices about what you do. You, you have to understand that it's subtle. Now, I'm not saying you don't get a pedicure, but I'm just saying it is as blatant as that. God says that all other gods are an abomination. So that's pantheism. Then there is what's called the dualistic view. And this is a bit more um, Middle Eastern in a sense, because we have yin and yang, where we have two powers, you know, two gods who are eternal. They're equal and they're all at war, and they're at war all the time. You know, some people will talk about it as mind and matter. That came up as a heresy in the second century. We talk about good and evil, absolute right and absolute wrong. We sometimes think, and, we, and sometimes we have been taught incorrectly in the church, that there is God and Satan, that they're sort of like equal and opposite. Good and evil, we call it light and darkness. It's false. There's one God. And we have to understand that anything where we equal, God is equal to somebody else, that automatically becomes two gods. That's dualism. And uh, the early Gnostics, that was a heresy within the church, held this view that the two gods were in conflict. And the conflict was, was f- played out amongst mankind. If you think about that, that's wrong. God doesn't say that at all. God is good. There is no power equal to him. Omniscient, omnipotent. So that's the, the dualist view, yin and yang. And there's the deistic view. And this is something I think that has crept into the church a little bit more recently. And that is the theory that God was only present when he created it. And he's not really here now. It's sort of like he developed all of the laws of nature. He set it in motion and then left the universe to run by these laws. Sort of like an absentee God. Now I'm sure... Off the top of my head, if I think about it, there's probably a verse that they would probably use to try and justify that. They're sort of, you know, the, the example is that they wound up, he, he wound up the universe like a clock and then he left it and he sort of comes back, comes back and checks it from time to time. And if you hold the deist view, it, it, it sort of teaches you incorrectly that you can reason out by looking at the universe who God is. And God does not allow that because God in the scriptures talks about special revelation. It misses the truth in actual fact that God is omnipresent. It misses the truth that he predestines it. It misses the truth that he is in control that he sees the past and he sees the future and he sees the present all as one. If you have a look at all of these different theistic views that we have are unsatisfactory. But if you think about it in all of those instances or most of those instances, there is a belief in a God of some sort. But it's always from us trying to seek out who he is and to define God in our own terms. It's much easier to serve a God that we define in our own terms because we can reach that particular standard. But if you try and reach the God of the scriptures, you can't reach it in your own terms. So in summary, pantheism makes all God and misses the God of all. Polytheism makes many gods and misses the one true God. Dualism makes good and evil two equal gods in conflict and fails to discover a God who will judge all evil. And deism presents an absentee God, a God who has nothing to do except when he created it 
and we miss on the omniscient and the omnipresent God. So they're the views that have a God in them. But there are non-theistic views that this world encourages at this time. There's the atheistic view. And so an atheist, in actual fact, uh, sorry, and, and atheism is broken up into a number of different schools. So one's called practical atheism. And it's a person who holds, um, a person who holds to practical atheism is someone who believes that there may be a God, but lives as if there is none. He has no interest in religion, and normally it's because of the hypocrisy amongst those people who profess that religion. So practically, they might even call themselves Catholic, but they don't live it because they're sick of hypocrites. That's practical atheism. It's not that they act, they'd probably be the ones in the census that say something like, oh my goodness gracious me, yeah, I don't quite believe in the God of the Bible. There's something there. But practically, they don't live it. They don't live their beliefs in any way, shape or form. So that's practical atheism. Dogmatic atheism is a person who openly declares his disbelief in the existence of any God. And, you know, a dogmatic atheist is one who says there is no God. I know there is no God. And practically, if you think about that, they have just set themselves up as God because I am no further aware at this moment of what's going on in this room. And I don't know if God is sitting outside the window if not, or not. So I can't say that. I can't say that. Virtual atheism. This view generates definitions of God to try and account for the world and for what happens. They use words like social consciousness or the unknowable or they'll talk about the moral order of the universe. It, it's, it's, it's virtual atheism. It makes God obscure. Then there's something called critical atheism. And this is sort of like a mind, a, a thought process. A critical atheist denies the existence of God because you can't prove or demonstrate the existence of God. It's like a mathematical equation. Then there is what's called classical atheism. And this is just denying that God or gods of a particular religion or all religions. Then there's something called re relationalistic atheism. And this view makes reason the king and takes faith away at all, takes faith totally away. There, you know, to, to think that someone needs faith to believe in the existence of God. That's just ridiculous, they'll say. They'll, they will say that reason is the only source of knowledge. And if you think about it, that points right back to Greek philosophy, right back in the 3rd century BC. And if you think about atheism, is actually unreasonable because we know that there's holes in their stories already and it's arrogant to the max. Because it ignores the existence of, of everything that we see in the universe. It ignores Romans chapter 1 verses 18, 19 and 20. And if you think about it, David says in Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Then there's the ad agnostic view. An agnostic view, um, you can't really say that it they don't care. It's more that you can't know whether there is a God or not. They don't say yes, they don't say no. It's like trying to walk a fence all of the time. And they will say something like, I can't know, you, you can't know, I don't know. And they say that we don't have enough knowledge of the universe yet or of nature in actual fact, if you think about it, it's sort of, it's like a belligerent, willfully ignorant child. 
But there are three different types of agnosticism. One is called positivism. Positivism says that there is nothing true beyond what you can observe. God can't be examined or observed, therefore he does not exist. Pragmatism. Um, I was going to say that it's fairly common today, but I would say positivism, pragmatism and existentialism are also pretty common today. Pragmatism holds that there's no special revelation from God. This doesn't actually exist and that we are incompetent or unable to discover God even if he did exist. We're not capable of it. Existentialism, which you've probably heard when you are in high school, holds that the philosophy or, whole, or is the philosophy that the individual can exercise their free will and do whatever they like in a purposeless universe. Um, the traffic laws of Queensland prove that's not true, unfortunately. Um, it, it's a, existentialism, which is what a lot of my lecturers at university held to in the 60s because a lot of them got it in French particularly. But that was a lot of what they were trying to push on us and I think it's come a lot into, into, the, into the modern Western mindset. But I think it's very, very interesting. We hold, a, so societally we have existential roots in Western society. But what I find very interesting is, you know, the question is, why is it wrong to pick up a baby and dash their head against the wall? Because if we were truly existential, you know, if we were truly able to exercise our own free will, if the universe was really purposeless, there would be nothing wrong with that. But yet everyone that you talk to will say, no, that's a heinous crime, which in actual fact is a moral argument for God. And we know it's just that very, very statement shows that both atheists and agnostics, their views are not tenable. You can't, you can't hold them. It doesn't work. Because, believe it or not, both of those, atheism and agnosticism, ignore our deepest convictions. They ignore what we think about in the dark of the night or when bad things happen to us. They ignore... The simple fact that we know that we are accountable if we break the law. Now, people will go, no, you don't. Yes, you do. Have you ever seen a young kid steal a biscuit? And you say, did they steal the biscuit? Did you steal the biscuit? What do they do? They don't go, yes. They go, no. We innately know that there is accountability. So in summary... The atheist says there is no God and therefore sets himself up as God. And the agnostic says he cannot know whether God exists and therefore is willfully ignorant of God. Before I go on, I'd like to say, normally in, when we're talking about the theology of God, we would go into God's attributes, etc., etc. I'm not. Because we do the attributes of God on the fourth Tuesday of the month. All right. So what I would like to do is finish very quickly with a Christian view. And this may actually be contrary to some of the things in some of the denominations that you come from. The Christian believes... That unless God takes the initiative, unless God reveals himself to us, we will never stumble on him. We won't be able to break through the darkness. We've fallen. We have blackened hearts. We are sinners to the max. And God had to send Jesus into the world so that we understood who he was. Ephesians 4.17 says this, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. That's us. They are darkened in their understanding. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them 
due to the hardness of their hearts. We can't switch on the light ourselves. The Holy Spirit has to do it. God does the pre-work. Because our wisdom is foolishness. Any philosophy that we come up with is not going to make it. And yet God did it all in Jesus Christ. Anything that we think up is foolishness. And we, we don't like to realise that. We don't like to think that. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 and forward following says this, For the word of the cross is foolishness, is folly, is crazy, is insanity to those who are perishing, to the world. But to us who are being saved... Who are being saved means there is an external influence working in our lives. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Why don't we understand? Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. You can think what you want, you're not going to make it. I, and the discerning, although the discernment of the discerning, discerning I will thwart. God is not going to let us, because of the fall, God is not going to let us to be able to work our brains out, to work out who he is. Where is the one who is wise? Verse 20. Where is the scribe? Where is the thinker? Where is the debater or the, the wise of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The smartest astrophysicist or the best geneticist one day, they're going to stand before God and say, and God's going to say, look, you saw it all. But you couldn't get there in your own wisdom. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom or through philosophy, it pleased God through the folly, through the insanity, through the seeming stupidity of what we preach to save those who believe. So God showed himself to us, not the other way around. But see, the other thing that a Christian believes is the fact that not only does God show himself to us through Jesus Christ, but he reveals himself through the scriptures. That's something that Christians, we, we say this is the word of God. But this is how God generally reveals himself to us. So we have to accept that God reveals himself to us. Otherwise, we will never know who he is. And as Christians, we actually have to rely on the scripture's description of who God is. Not an amalgamation of what the world thinks and the Bible. You'll never get there that way. God is spirit. God is a personal being. God is light. God is love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you revealed yourself to us in Jesus Christ. And we worship you and we thank you for giving us your word in this tome. Help us to revere it but not worship it. Help us to worship Christ as he is who you are. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.